NFL week three is here and make sure you guys hit that subscribe button for more future content like what you're going to see in today's video. I'm sure you're going to really enjoy as I go through mine and Austin's pick them and predictions for week three of the NFL season. Of course, this is a series we started last year and it went really well. So we are continuing it through this year and we're already into week three. Crazy how fast the season is already going by. And here's our pick'em records. I was down big after week one, but I made some really out there calls uh, and it paid off for me this week. I'm back in the run in here with our pick'em wizard, of course, Austin. He's not able to join today. And just a quick note, we are recording this before the Monday night football games, simply because of our schedules this week, we couldn't line it up in a way that worked best for both of us. So I figured let's get it out right now so that everyone can get to watch this when they have time. Uh, and it's going to work the best this way. But I'm 18, 13, and 1. Just one game back of Austin, who's 19, 12, and 1. Both pretty good records. Over 500 already early in the season, which is a good indication uh, that, hey, the season's going to go maybe a little bit as we're expecting. Of course, there's been some real upset games in there, especially week one. What a crazy ending to week one. Uh, but week two's kind of settled down a little bit more. And as we move forward, let's look at Thursday Night Football here. Steelers. At Browns, we have an interdivision game here in week three between two teams that right now are one and one. The Steelers probably feel like they could be two and oh after losing a close game to New England. And the Browns probably feel like they should be two and oh after a catastrophic loss to the New York Jets in which they had a double digit lead going into the two minute warning essentially after scoring a touchdown. Uh, and now instead find themselves one and one after blowing it with giving up a huge touchdown to Corey Davis and then Garrett Wilson across the middle. Joe Flacco led a huge comeback. And the Browns kind of let them do that. And I think that really is part of the reason on why both Austin and myself are going with the Steelers here. The Browns, Jacoby Brissett's not someone who's going to elevate this team. Now, is Kareem Hunt a really good running back? Is Nick Chubb a really good running back? Yes, the Browns can move the football down the field for sure, but they don't have the guy right now while they're waiting for Deshaun Watson to go win you a game. They just don't have that. It proved it in week two when Jacoby Brissett threw an interception to close that one out. They just don't have the talent at the quarterback spot while they are waiting for Deshaun Watson to clear suspensions. So Steelers are the pretty safe bet here. Now, do they have the guy to go win you a game? Maybe not in Mitchell Trubisky, but what they do have is a ton of great defensive playmakers. And I think one who is already off to a really great start this year, Minka Fitzpatrick, two interceptions in his first two games. And I think it's very likely he could end up with a third through three games here going against Cleveland. If this becomes a throwing match in any way, I prefer Pittsburgh here quite a bit. You know, obviously Brissett, Trubisky, there's not a huge gap between them, but Trubisky a lot more mobile and who knows. It's possible, too, we could get some Kenny Pickett. If the Steelers struggle early in this one, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Pickett. But at the end of the day, I just trust the Steelers a little bit more here than Cleveland. Even though the Browns are at home, I think this is going to be a good competitive game. But if Brissett has to go win you a game, I just don't buy it. That's why I have the Steelers here on Thursday night, which brings us into our Sunday slate of games, which, again, is a really good collection uh, of different games that we have this week. Uh, there's going to be a lot of good matchups in here, some in division, some out of division. I think it's going to be a really telling week for the NFL season. So let's jump into it here. The Bills, who are 1-0 before Monday Night Football, and of course, that was a really dominant win over the Los Angeles Rams to start off the NFL season. And then the Dolphins at 2-0 with a huge comeback win against the Baltimore Ravens. And when we're talking about the importance of Tyreek Hill and also Jalen Waddle there in Miami, that is why. Without those two guys, you can't erase multi-digit leads. Like if it's a 21-point game and you don't have those two guys, you're not coming back. But Miami luckily does have those guys. And we actually see split here. Austin went with the Bills, and they're a great team. The Bills arguably are the best team in the NFL this season. There's a really good case to be made for Buffalo. And I think he's playing it safe here, going with the Buffalo Bills, even though they're on the road at Hard Rock Stadium. I feel like he just trusts the roster talent, trusts the quarterback play of Josh Allen, and I can't fault him. I'm going with the Dolphins, though, at 2-0. and And it's not just about 2-0. and It's also about Tua Tagovailoa. He's been really good this season so far. Now, I'm not counting on him to be an MVP candidate. I don't think he's a top-10 quarterback in the NFL all of a sudden. 
But what I do think is he's been competitive and Miami got the right pieces around him with the right head coach for the job. And I think, you know, the Bills aren't going to go undefeated here. That's another part and element to what I'm predicting here. Just because I'm not picking the Bills doesn't mean I think they're bad or that the Dolphins are necessarily better. But I just don't think the Bills are going to win every single game on their schedule. And this looks like one of those tough matchups where if the Bills get their win on Monday Night Football, you're looking at two 2-0 teams in one division. And I'm going to give the advantage to the home team here in Miami. Not like Miami has the greatest home field advantage, but it's still home field advantage. And I think that they have the roster and the talent to at least compete with Buffalo, make this a really close and competitive game. And at the end of the day, I really like Tyree Kill. I really like Jalen Waddell. And I think that team can give other teams the business. And I've got Miami here giving Buffalo the business. This is going to be one of the best games of the week for sure. Then we have the 0-2 Bengals at the... One and one New York Jets. And even though I'm a Jets fan, the Bengals feel like a really safe pick here. The season has started tumultuously for them. They want to get back on track, and this is the game to do it. They're going to go at the Jets. Sauce Gardner got banged up a little bit. This past week, we'll have to see how he's looking before Sunday. But I think here the Bengals do get back on track and move themselves to one and two. And let's not get too high on the Jets either, right? The Browns threw that game. The Jets took advantage, but I wouldn't say that the Jets played super great throughout that one. You know, they gave up three rushing touchdowns to Nick Chubb. There's definite holes on this Jets football team still. They're young, and if Joe Flacco is your QB, I just don't love your odds. Yes, I know he took advantage of Cleveland toward the end of the game, but that's very specific in a niche situation. For about the last three years, we haven't really seen great Joe Flacco. And you could even argue out to about four or five years for Joe Flacco. So here for me, I think the Bengals just a little bit safer. Austin clearly felt that as well. Uh, and the Bengals, I, I just think they're the better team here. Uh, at an 0-2 record, though, obviously I understand some of the concerns, but they've been close games both times, obviously losing to Cooper Rush isn't a good luck. But don't forget that the Vikings did that last year, still ended up having a pretty good season. Bengals, I don't think they're going to be back in the Super Bowl. I felt like last year was kind of their ceiling, what they could touch at that point. The O-line has to play better, but I think against this Jets defense, this is a good get-right game for them. Moving into the next one here, Raiders at 0-2, going into Tennessee to take on the Titans, who are still winless before Monday Night Football at an 0-1 record in that AFC South, which is probably the worst division in all of football right now. I think the Raiders here are the clear favorites. I just don't know how the Titans match up with Devontae Adams. We'll have to keep our eyes on Hunter Renfro who obviously got concussed on the final play of the game against the Cardinals. And that was an epic collapse by Las Vegas as well. I don't want to, you know, go without highlighting that. They were up big, had a bad defensive holding call on a, a key play for the end of that game right around the goal line, gave Arizona new life. Kyler Murray's able to scamper into the end zone, and then he makes a phenomenal throw to send it to overtime on a two-point conversion attempt. Uh, and then at that point, you know, you thought, okay, well, maybe Vegas can still get this job done. Hunter Renfro gets lit up, ball pops out, Arizona gets on it, and they start running with it the other way. Really bad collapse for Vegas toward the end of a game where they're up by eight. It was 23 to 15 with about eight seconds left, and they couldn't get the job done. So it's probably pretty easy to be low on them. But when you look at the roster, I just think they're flat out better than Tennessee. And we'll see this week if they can get the job done and and really take care of business here because in that division you can't afford to move to 0-3 now we have the Saints at 1-1 and and the Panthers at 0-2 and and this is one of those games where you know Jameis Winston struggled and this is going to be a really important game for him we obviously heard Devin White call him out after their game against the Buccaneers saying hey we knew he is turnover prone through 30 interceptions with us a few years ago. We just want to go get our hands on the football. And that's what the Panthers are going to have to do here to win this game. They're going to have to generate some turnovers. And Jameis is going to have to have another meltdown performance for the Saints to lose this one. Saints are just flat out better than Carolina. It's not super surprising to me that the Panthers are 0-2. And I think here as well, as long as Jameis Winston can get back on track, take care of the football, Things are going to go his way. Last week was a little tough because he had to become very throw heavy toward the end of that one. Of course, no Alvin Kamara. Uh, and just with the situation of the game, they had to try and air it out down the field, uh, especially after his first interception 
uh, where Jamel Dean made a really nice play and, and took it for a house call. I think the Saints here, if they can control this game from the start, which I think they're very capable of, you know, the, playing against the Buccaneers defense and the Panthers defense are two different things. The Buccaneers are one of the best defenses in the league. Panthers, probably the opposite end of the spectrum there. So I think the Saints get the job done. Austin feels the same way for probably most of the same reasons. Here we have the Ravens who are at one and one going into New England to take on the Patriots one and one. And yes, Foxborough is one of those tough places to play. But me and Austin both prefer the road team Ravens here in this one. And part of the reason why, despite, again, another monumental collapse where they're up by 21 plus points against the Miami Dolphins heading into, you know, that fourth quarter. The Ravens have had two dominant leads throughout the first two games of the season. They destroyed the New York Jets on week one in week one, excuse me. And then they were on pace to destroy the Miami Dolphins in week two. Obviously, that game did not end the way that they thought it could. But now let's not go into this week and pretend that Devontae Parker or some of the other weapons there in New England are going to give you what Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill give you. And let's not even pretend like Mac Jones is much better than Tua Tagovailoa. I think those two are in a very similar tier in terms of passers. Uh, You know, accurate, not super dominant. They're not going to be a big, strong arm QB. Uh, And I think realistically here, Baltimore, they just have the better team. They have more talent. I think J.K. Dobbins, there's a real chance he plays this week which would be huge for them. Uh, You know, that running game just hasn't looked the same quite yet. Obviously, Lamar Jackson has been doing his thing. But I think you get Dobbins in there. One of the better running backs in the NFL, especially when you look at his yards per carry throughout his career. Nearly six yards per carry for his career, which is just insane. And I think the Ravens here can get the job done against New England. It's not going to be easy, but I think they're going to win this game by anywhere from three to seven points, which I think is going to be a really important win for them at this point of the year. Then we have the one and one Lions going into Minnesota to U.S. Bank Stadium to play the Vikings, who are 1-0 and before Monday Night Football. And I think this was pretty clear cut. If the Lions were at home, you'd give the Lions some real consideration. But we're going to go with the Vikings here. And the reason why is, first of all, the Lions are a young team, so they're going to typically struggle more on the road than they do at home. I think we saw the difference between this team from week one to week two. Playing at home against the Commanders was huge for that organization, and they got out early. They didn't really close that game super well, but they closed it nonetheless. And the Vikings are just, I think, a little bit more talented than Detroit as well. So the fact that they're at home against a younger team, it gives me a lot of confidence in them. And I really love what we've seen so far from O'Connell really, you know, guiding the ship here, getting Justin Jefferson the ball. We'll see how they look on Monday Night Football as well. I think it's going to be a really great story and sign of what's to come for Minnesota. If they can move to 2-0 and and then potentially 3-0, and that's a phenomenal start for this team. But nonetheless, can't put your, you know, wagon in front of the cart, so to speak. But at the end of the day, the Vikings here, I think they get the job done against Detroit. Eagles 1-0 and before Monday Night Football. They do take on the Minnesota Vikings tonight, the day I'm recording this. So it'll be very impactful, that game. And I think it's going to really show who some of the best teams in the NFC are facing the Commanders, who are at 1-1 and and clearly not one of the best teams in the NFC. You know, a close win over Jacksonville, a somewhat tight loss to Detroit, despite a massive failure to start that game, going down 22 to nothing. The Eagles are the safe pick here. If you're playing any type of pick em fantasy, you'll want to pick the Philadelphia Eagles. You do not want to land on Washington here. The Eagles, even though they're going into Washington, they're just the better team. Top to bottom, better quarterback, better receivers. You know, like that receiver conversation is a little close, but I think A.J. Brown's the best of the bunch. Uh, you know, they're going to have good running back play, especially when they rotate guys in. I, I trust their offensive line. I trust their D-line. You know, the D-line for Washington is really good. But there's some flaws still here in Washington. I don't trust Carson Wentz. Maybe he'll be fired up to get back at his old team. If so, that would be great. But I think the Eagles here get the job done uh, against Washington on Sunday. Then we have the 2-0 Chiefs at the 0-1-1 Colts. And to say that this season started out disappointingly for Indianapolis would be an understatement. This team has not looked good. They got shut out by the Jacksonville Jaguars who 
it was clear Jacksonville was going to win. Indianapolis cannot go into Jacksonville and get a win. Just doesn't happen. The Jaguars dominate Indy at home. But the Chiefs are just so much better than Jacksonville. They're a 2-0, had a really good win over the Los Angeles Chargers, uh, 27-24 in Week 2. And I think the Chiefs at this point, 2-0 record, they're really a lock here to move to 3-0 in my estimation. You know, the Colts, they need to get back on track. Obviously, not having Michael Pittman against Jacksonville really hurt. It'd probably be a little bit of a different ball game if he was there because he's the best receiver on that team. He's one of the better receivers in the NFL. But let's not forget that Christian Kirk really, you know, dotted up that team uh, with Trevor Lawrence, two touchdowns of his own. Uh, and, you know, James Robinson got what he wanted on the ground as well. The Jaguars dominated the Colts start to finish. And I think the Chiefs very well could do that here too, even though they're playing in Indianapolis. Then we have the 0-1-1 Texans versus the 1-1 and Bears. And I think the Texans here are going to make their record a split 1-1-1 one, one, and one record, which is crazy. Very rarely do you ever see that by week three of the NFL season. But I'm predicting that that's a real possibility here for Houston. I like Houston's team a little bit more than Chicago here. And part of the reason why is Darnell Mooney has just struggled to get involved this year. And you also look at the play of rookie cornerback Derek Stingley. We said it all last draft cycle. When Derek Stingley's healthy, he's phenomenal. He's been really good to start the season here. Up to this point, obviously the Texans don't have a ton of bright spots, but neither do the Bears. You know, one and one, they won kind of a quirky game against Trey Lance and the 49ers, where basically they were playing on a slip and slide type field. Uh, you know, I'm not going to buy a ton of stock in that win. I, I do think the Texans are kind of right in that same category as the Bears. So this really becomes a, a coin flip on who you got. Austin clearly prefers the Bears at home here at Soldier Field. Definitely is an advantage for two young QBs, but let's not sugarcoat it. Davis Mills has been better early in his career than Justin Fields has. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about Trevor Lawrence, you know, and I understand that. The Bears here are you know, not much better than what Jacksonville's presented. And I think that Trevor Lawrence has had some real, you know, flashes and signs of, of brilliance at points, especially when you look at some of his longer drives. I'm not talking just single plays. I'm talking about orchestra orchestrating drives together. I think he's had more success than Justin Fields, which is the expectation, obviously. Fields was a guy who was going to need a little bit of development time, whereas Lawrence was the ready-made player who, even though he hasn't looked as great as everyone expected, I just think that Fields hasn't really lived up to the hype either at this point. Remember, after Clemson played Ohio State and, and Fields got the better of him, a lot of people were saying Fields should go first overall. Let's not act like, you know, this was a cut and dry decision. Most people, in fact, in my comment section were saying that Justin Fields should be the first overall pick after that game, which is insane. Nonetheless, I have the Texans. Austin's got the Bears. I think this is going to be an interesting matchup, one that I probably won't want to watch a ton of. Uh, this next week just because there's better games going on uh, between more competitive teams but this game you know two bad teams play each other you're going to have some competition and, and we'll see who comes out on top then we have the one and one jaguars at the one and one chargers and this is where the nfl early in the season records lie the jaguars are not as good as the chargers i think that's obvious for everybody watching uh, and despite Austin being a Jaguars fan, despite my love for picking the Jaguars during Pick'em, uh, and if you guys have been watching the channel, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I picked them twice so far this year. They almost got the win over Washington, so it would have been huge for me if they did. Uh, but ultimately here at this point, we're both going with the Chargers. They're just the better team. I think the one thing to watch, Justin Herbert and his ribs obviously got shook up on Thursday Night Football against the Chiefs. And we'll see if he's able to go. If not, this could change the game here. I think the Jaguars, despite being significantly worse as a roster, you know, if Keenan Allen's banged up, if Justin Herbert's banged up, the Jaguars could have a shot here. But I think the Chargers at home at SoFi Stadium, it's the safer pick, and it's the pick you have to make in your pick'em leagues. You, you just can't go out here and, and, you know, throw the Jaguars around as your pick. You know, I, you guys know I love to do that. But here, you have to be really serious and, and take the chance. Uh, take the Chargers over the Jaguars at home. Then we have the one and one Rams at the one and one Cardinals. And, you know, with 10 minutes to go in that game against the Raiders, I thought a lot of people were going to hit the panic button on the Arizona Cardinals. It looked like they were going to move to 0 and 2. And had they, it would have been a big storyline after the Kyler Murray extension and all the drama in the news. Cardinals going 0 and 2 to start the year would have been really bad 
for them, especially when it comes when it comes to narrative, which is one of the most important things in all of sports. But the Rams here are just better, right? They're one and one. Kind of got back on track against the Falcons this week. They looked very, very good against Atlanta. Kind of took Kyle Pitts completely out of that game. If you have Kyle Pitts in fantasy, don't do something stupid and trade him. If you don't have Kyle Pitts in fantasy, try to trade for him right now. Trust me, go get him. He's one of the most versatile players in the NFL. He's really, really good. You don't look at a lot of rookie tight ends getting 1,000 yards receiving. It just doesn't happen. Kyle Pitts is that type of player. Now, I know that Atlanta doesn't have a ton of talent there, but just because the Rams slowed him down doesn't mean he's going to get slowed down every single week. So go buy him right now. But the Rams here are just better team. Uh, you know, Stafford threw it to Allen Robinson a little bit more this past week, like I predicted in our week two uh, pick them in predictions. Uh, and I think the Rams here moved to two and one, Cardinals down to one and two. And they're going to be looking up in that division. It's going to be a tough one. Every team there in the NFC West is one and one at this point. So this is a really pivotal game early in the season. Buccaneers hosting the Packers. Of course, the Buccaneers moved to 2-0 after what was a somewhat shaky beginning of a start against the New Orleans Saints to a really dominant closing of that game. And the Packers just kind of ran the Bears all Sunday night football long. Uh, you know, there was no surprise that the Packers are a better team than Chicago, but I think the Buccaneers are a better team than Green Bay, especially since this game's at Raymond James Stadium. And this Buccaneers defense is legit. Through two games, they've given up one touchdown, and they've also scored a touchdown. They have basically generated as many points themselves as they've allowed, which is insane through two weeks. And they played Dallas and New Orleans. That's two teams that have some offensive talent. Obviously, you know, Dak Prescott goes down. Jameis Winston kind of unravels toward the end of a game. But ultimately, the Buccaneers, 2-0, record doesn't lie, and their defense doesn't either. Uh, they've made a ton of plays. Jamel Dean's a really good outside corner. Carlton Davis was really locked in against Michael Thomas. Obviously gave up some stuff underneath, but, you know, made him work for every single inch he got. And I think against an inexperienced Packers team, who's probably going to have to rely on Alan Lazard, assuming he, you know, is healthy and can play in week three, I think that Carlton Davis, Jamel Dean, more than up to the challenge to shut down the Packers' younger, inexperienced wide receivers. And I think this is one of those games that, hey, Tom Brady's going to get Aaron Rodgers again, and we're going to really have a good settled debate on who the GOAT is. You know, a lot of people love to say Aaron Rodgers based on the arm talents. Well, last year, Tom Brady led the NFL in average velocity per throw, uh, and he also throws the ball deeper than Aaron Rodgers on average as well. So if you want to talk arm talents, probably the guy who throws it harder and further more consistently. Uh, and I think Tom Brady probably gets the win here as well against the Green Bay Packers moving to 3-0 and and really taking a good stronghold in that division. Here we have the 0-2 Falcons heading into Seattle to take on the 1-1 and -1 Seahawks. Austin's going with the Falcons here and I understand why. You know, the Seahawks are not the greatest team. Still starting Geno Smith. If the Falcons have a game here to win, it would be this one. And if this game was in Atlanta, I would be right with him taking the Falcons. But we've seen the impact of the 12s. Seahawks beat the Broncos at home already this year. And I think the Seahawks could really take down the Falcons here as well. This is one of our another, another split decision between us here. I, I like Austin's pick of the Falcons. I do. I think the Falcons are a little bit more talented, to be honest with you. Uh, but we'll see what they get out of Kenneth Walker this week for Seattle. And I think Kyle Pitts, if the Falcons do win, he's going to be the main reason why. I expect him to go over 60, 70 yards receiving, probably get you anywhere from 12 to 15 fantasy points this week. I'm banking on that as well. I have him in my dynasty league. I took him last year uh, as a rookie, and I felt really good about it when he was putting up numbers. First two weeks of the season been a little rough. Don't sell your stock, though, on Kyle Pitts. I think he's going to have a really nice week three here against Seattle. The 1-1 one one 49ers take on the 1-1 one one Broncos, and no surprise here that both Austin and myself go with San Francisco here, even though this game's in Denver at Mile High Stadium. San Francisco just flat out is better than Denver. Uh, you know, everyone got really excited about Denver. Nathaniel Hackett is looking like the wrong head coaching hire. And Russell Wilson hasn't looked like himself in a year and a half. If we're going to be completely honest about it, Russell Wilson struggled last year with Seattle. And he's struggling right now against Denver. We'll also, or with Denver, excuse me. And we'll also have to see if Jerry Judy is able to go against the 49ers this week. I think that's going to be huge. I think one unsung hero for this 49ers team is Traverius Ward. He was a really nice addition onto that defense. Gave them a, a true boundary corner who could stick one-on-one -on -one with guys. So we're probably going to see him matched up with Cortland Sutton this week, if I had to guess. 
And I think that's going to be a really telling move for San Francisco and and really pivotal for their chances to win this football game. Uh, Yeah, and Jimmy Garoppolo, you know, this is why they kept him around. Trey Lance, fun, flashy, young guy, going to come in, change that offense. He looked really good in camp. Great. Breaks his ankle. This is why you have Jimmy G. You bring him back for one more year and say, hey, we want you to be a part of this organization, even if it isn't as a planned starter. Well, guess what? He comes into the game and absolutely balls out in week two, despite not being with the team for most of camp uh, and ends up playing really, really well. And I think that's something we're going to see continue. I would advise picking up Jimmy Grappolo in fantasy if you haven't already. When he's been the starter, he's finished top 15 in fantasy as a quarterback in two of the last three years. So that's a really good tell, tell sign that, hey, this could be a reliable backup QB for me in fantasy. Now, do you want him to be your your lone starter in fantasy football? No, probably not. And you probably don't want him to be your lone starter throughout the course of an NFL season either, but he's a really great backup option, which I think is really good for San Francisco here. And I also think it's good for your fantasy football lineups as well, in case you're curious. Then we get to Monday Night Football. Of course, that Broncos Niners game is prime time on Sunday night, but here we are. Monday Night Football, the one on one Cowboys at the 2 and 0 Giants and, you know, <laughs> this is going to be my third Cowboys game I've watched this year. Uh and you know, they looked pretty good. Cooper Rush really played well against the Cincinnati Bengals. I wasn't surprised by that. People forgot about Cooper Rush's game against the Vikings last year where he played pretty well. Um, and you know, I thought the Bengals were just the better team and Cooper rush being in there limited Dallas's chances, but they came out and balled and Micah Parsons is that dude, but I still have the giants winning here simply because this game is taking place in East Rutherford, New Jersey giants, I think are very similar to the Cowboys, especially when you look at the QB spot right now, just the fact that, you know, there is no Dak Prescott. If there was Dak, I would probably pick Dallas. And I know I was just singing Cooper Rush's praises. Let's just not act like those two guys are the same, though. Dak does a lot of different things that Cooper Rush is just not capable of doing, especially with Dak's feet. And I think here, when you look at it, the Giants, they have a real chance to move to 3-0. Brian Dable's been doing a great job calling plays, really, you know, leading this team to victories. The fact that the Giants are 2-0, that's huge for that team. Saquon Barkley's looked really good up to this point of the season. Uh, And I think as long as they continue to move the football down the field, they're going to do just fine. And I think maybe there's a little bit of room here to pick on Trayvon Diggs a little bit. We'll see how much they test him. Could lead to a couple turnovers as well. That's really going to be one of the things to watch for in this game. But here we both have the Giants moving on to a 3-0 start to the season, which is absolutely insane and incredible for that organization. Thank you guys all so much for watching. Hopefully you did enjoy today's video. If you did, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content like this, and we'll catch you in the very next utility sports video.